Okay, we're going to take a, a quite a slight break from the presentations now, and I'll ask uh, Rory and Cathy to, to stay on the stage to be joined by uh, Professor John Dinesh from the University of Cambridge and uh, Professor Ronan Lyons from the University of Swansea um, for, a, for a panel discussion, a broader discussion on this uh, topic. So I'd encourage you really to uh, ask questions as broadly as you like. Um, who would like to start? I mean, one thing I might kick off with, um, yes, would you mind Tim, then? is uh, you, we're, we're looking for what we haven't done from the audience as well. Um, you know, what else could be done uh, in terms of phenotyping the disease? Because uh, um, typically in prospective studies, there's a lot of focus on phenotyping the participants. Um, and a criticism of, of them often is that the, the disease outcomes are not phenotyped well enough. Uh, the working group that John has headed up um, with a lot of people from a lot of different areas have, have thought of, of lo lots of ways of, of doing that. Um, and we've also been thinking about lots of ways in which to follow up particular diseases. But you know, we're, we're also aware of the limitations, and particularly the limitations of linkage um, uh, for those disease outcomes that um, aren't diagnosed well. Um, and so we will be touching on that a bit later when John Gallagher talks about the use of, of web questionnaires and other kinds of questionnaire approaches to um, identifying diseases that aren't diagnosed. Um, so can we detect a cognitive decline um, during follow-up um, or mental health uh, conditions that haven't been diagnosed through questionnaire-based approaches? Um, uh, and I think we're, we're, we're certainly you know, looking for ideas from people about what are the disease outcomes that may not be picked up from linkage that we should be using these questionnaire approaches for quality of life, um, disability, and things like that. Uh, so, questions? While, while people are thinking, obviously, after their lunch, um, I'd start with a question. Cathy, what, what information do you think that we'll get from the, the primary care data that will be informative? And what, what are the challenges there around uh, adjudication, both in terms of, the, of the, the outcomes themselves, but secondly, the logistics of just doing that? Yes, yeah, so um, primary care data are obviously crucially important in the UK for all of those conditions that are managed mainly or in some cases almost entirely outside hospital. And some examples would be diabetes, for example, which um, I think we see the tip of the iceberg in hospital and most diabetes is cared for now in the community and increasingly follow-up diabetes clinics are conducted in primary care rather than secondary care. Um, and another example would be asthma um, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease where the really bad exacerbations um, wind up in hospital but there's a lot of morbidity that's enormously important to the public health and economically important out there in the community. And it's only through linking to the sources of where those um, individuals have their healthcare contacts that we can get a handle on conditions like that. So I think that that's why it's important. Um, getting hold of it um, is harder, although all of our participants have consented um, to um, access their primary care records, there, there isn't yet a really good national system as there is now for hospital episode um, statistics and the equivalents in Scotland and Wales, um, although you know, we may be moving towards such a system. Um, uh, some of you know about the work done at the Health and Social Care Information Centre to try and um, create a system called the GP Extraction Service, um, which um, has been, um, uh, we, um, and we worked with them very, very closely for a number of years, um, and they've had to um, uh, stop and think for a little while while they consult with the public further over care.data, which is one of the projects that they've been subserving. 
Um, and of course, that's a project that doesn't require individual participant consent. So in many ways, UK Biobank has a very particular advantage because all the participants have specifically consented to linkage, but some of the systems that are set up to facilitate linkage have actually been set up for non-consented studies and so have a higher bar for, in terms of information governance and so on. But I think we will get there with primary care data. It is extremely important that we do, and we're continuing to work with lots of different potential routes of, of getting it, which is um, what, we, what we have consent to do. Um, when we do get it, it will come from several different system suppliers, um, which collect data in somewhat different ways from individual general practices. It's formatted in different ways, and then it may be extracted using different extraction tools, um, which means that it undergoes a further twist or change along the path before it can be received by us. It may be coded in different ways by different uh, system supplier systems, and over time the coding changes. So there are different versions of something called read coding, which is used in general practice. And the read coding system, um, which I'm not enormously familiar with, is, is um, a rather quirky um, system which has somewhere in excess of 300,000 codes for different diseases, conditions, symptoms, signs, and all the rest of it. So it requires a great deal of work to move from that coding, which is used differently in different practices around the country, to disease phenotypes, if you like. And quite a lot of work has already gone on for particular diseases to try and um, make codes into phenotypes. A lot of that work's been done by Ronan Lyons' group in Swansea, um, by groups such as um, Harry Hemingway's in London, and by many other groups around the country. And we're very interested in hearing from you if you can um, help us in the next stage in our endeavor, which will be to do exactly that, to make primary care codes into something that's meaningful um, for research purposes. Yeah, yes, if, if we've got a couple of questions. If we could take the, the gentleman here first. Hi, uh, Andy Lawton, GSK. Could you say something about if you're likely to get hospital prescribing data uh, into the database? Also, if you think there's any value in, in retail uh, pharmacy dispensing as opposed to describing, prescribing, um, any, any interest in looking into pri private healthcare? And also what you think the impact of the European uh, data protection regulations might be. Who would be a good person to address that? Ronan, could you have a... Yeah, I could have a go. Um, the last one would be disastrous. Um, that's easy. Uh, I, I, and people may confuse issues about consent. Um, if the regulations came in as the way they're set up, the systems that supply much of the data um, centralizing systems such as HES and all of those things would actually become illegal. So you would not be able to flow data on, on from, from those data sources to participants even with consent because the underlying systems such as cancer registries and those would no longer exist. Um, so that, that would be particularly problematic. Um, in terms of some of the other data sources, um, Dispensing data, I think, has the, has the greatest uh, amount of chance, uh, particularly it's already collected in Scotland, it's collected in Wales. Uh, they largely collect it centrally because they have free prescriptions and therefore somebody has to have a way of paying for them. I'm not sure, I, I don't think there's a centralised dispensing system in England. Um, hospital prescribing is absolutely essential, but the speed of rollout of computerised prescribing systems in hospitals is still quite slow, but it is, it is improving quite, quite a bit. And I think the private sector is quite challenging for a study like Biobank. I wanted to point out one thing about the GP data, in, in that um, we are, we've probably made a lot more progress than people think, in that whilst um, I think about 20 or 30,000 of the biobank participants now have GP data linked to them from Scotland and Wales. Um, the outcome adjudication panels also have access to linked data um, using primary care data on about a million of the population in Wales. And so you can actually develop algorithms from one set of multi-source data which then will be applied to the half million as more data flow. Thanks, Ron. Question at the back there? Yep. And then Soren, uh, you, you after this one. Uh, Ken Muir, Manchester. Do you have any uh, plans to 
uh, look at the relationship between self-reported illness for the various conditions and these algorithms, and then separate to that, uh, in other areas where you've got a more robust definition of disease, have these algorithms been validated, any of the important diseases? And then the third part is, will you be looking at well-being as a positive outcome? John, could you possibly address the first couple of those from your area? I think I can address at least a couple of those. So as regards to self-report versus coded data or other sources of data, as uh, Kathy Sudlow alluded to, and I think Rory alluded to as well, we'll have a presentation this afternoon from John Gallagher, who will talk about the design, the intended design or the planned design of web-based questionnaires so that some self-reported outcomes can be captured. And part of that will be to try to capture the types of outcomes that would otherwise be difficult to capture through other routes, but part of it might be for triangulation and cross-checking. So I think John Gallagher will discuss that in further detail. I think uh, the question that you asked about uh, other aspects of uh, validation kind of comes back to one of the questions that Kathy answered earlier, which is it's going to be very disease-specific, the extent to which different data sets, through cross-referencing -refer different data sets, there is concordance of diagnoses, um, and I think that's, that's the key theme. I think one of the, the, the gaps that we have is we have only a handful of good examples. Myocardial infarction is a good example where, as Kathy alluded to, the work of Harry Hemingway has used different data sources to provide perhaps su surprising degrees of non-concordance amongst what should be good sets of different data, and I think that the difficulty or the challenge there will be trying to come up with disease diagnoses that are expressed with some kind of confidence in the presence of that kind of uncertainty, but that's what we have, and that's what we, that, that's what's our challenge. Roy, did you want to address the last part of the question? Could you just uh, remind us, Ken, what your, your last part was? It was just a, sorry, <laughs> it was just a query about well-being because mm. that's a, a topic that's gaining ground, and um, people always tend to look at associations with negative outcomes such mm. as diseases, but to find what genetic and environmental determinants dictate happy people is also worth looking at. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think that's where um, we're just starting with these web questionnaires um, in terms of assessing outcome, um, uh, the cognitive function, the, the mental health. Um, uh, but the intent would be that um, there would be a, a series of web questionnaires repeated over time, um, uh, looking at things like quality of life, um, not only looking at health outcomes, there could be some that looked at changes in exposures around smoking or whatever, but, but primarily they will inc increasingly be about different kinds of components of, of, of health outcome um, that wouldn't be picked up through linkage. And again, we're looking for the academic community to say what are the things that should be incorporated in that, and then it, goes, it comes back to the, the team to work out how to, to do that. Okay, thanks, Roy. There was one more question just down here. Actually, Roy, you just, uh, you just answered my question, but uh, the, the repeated assessment of exposures, could that be considered a much more systematic program, rolling program with web technologies being the predominant force of the assessment, or are you actually also considering maybe re-inviting the whole cohort ultimately? <laughs> for some of the, should we say, more clinical measures of, of, uh, or characteristics of, of reassessment? The, the current plan is to do repeat assessments where we physic, physically face-to-face -face on uh, around 20,000 every few years. However, if, if the pilot for the imaging works well, um, then we will be doing a face-to-face -face with 100,000 participants over a five-year period where we'll be doing uh, a repeat of pretty much all of the baseline assessment visit, um, plus the collection of all the samples, uh, as well as, as the imaging. Um, that's as far as we've got, uh, because of course, the, the costs associated with face-to-face -face on this scale are, are really quite substantial. But I mean, certainly that kind of thing is, is possible in the long term. Okay, I think we've, we've just got time for one more question. Uh, you're Ben Shlomo, University of Bristol. Uh, I think this is related to Cathy. Can I just ask, um, HSCIC have recently released um, data, for example, on neurological diseases using outpatient hospital codes. 
And I just wonder how good is the completeness of that code? And particularly if you look longitudinally, we all know how people's diagnoses can change or revert and go from one condition to another. Uh, have you explored or looked at those issues? Um, we've really focused largely on the on the major national sources that are likely to be not disease specific so far, um, and it's taken a substantial amount of time to get those nuts and bolts in place, as you like, if you like, so to bring us up to the kind of state of the art for today. Um, we have done some work on the more disease specific registers and initiatives that there are around, and. My general feeling on those, although it's not perhaps as highly informed as some other people's, and I'd like people to tell me if I'm wrong, is that many disease-specific audit and registry projects have a fairly short lifespan. There are some exceptions, and it's those exceptions that I think are likely to be most useful. So the NICOR data sets have a longevity that makes them, I think, potentially very useful. Some of the... Um, uh, uh, systems for stroke, for example, there's a stroke audit system in Scotland which has been running for many years and there is a, a system now being developed um, in England which is becoming a national system and if it gets good coverage and looks like it will have legs and carry on for a period of time then it will also be useful moving forward. Some of the other initiatives um, and I have had some interactions with I think if you're talking about the neurology uh, system I think you are it's the one that David Bateman has been very involved with no well perhaps we should talk offline you can tell me about the system you're talking about because I think I mean we don't know about everything that's for sure um, so the more information we can get from people in this room and elsewhere the better really thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. I think we should uh, continue now with the programme. To thank uh, John, Ronan, Rory and Cathy, I'll just ask Rory to stay with us because he's going to introduce the next section uh, concerning recontacting.